Okay, so cheers guys. Thank you again for coming. I didn't know how many people to expect and um, I know when you try new things, just never know how they're gonna turn out. So I really do appreciate you guys being here. Um, and I guess we shall begin. I'll start again. Um, my chosen name is Evelyn Wallace. I have chosen a lot of new parts of my identity since like a big shift happened in my life. Come on in, guys. Um, one, one of those one of those changes um, has been like the name I choose to call myself. Um, so if you hear other people calling me, sorry, beer and wine time is over. Bar is closed. Welcome to my party. You're late. Can you? Do you guys want something to drink? There's one, there's beer and wine. I know you're right, you're right, but um, then I like to swoop in like, the, like, a, like, a, like a micromanaging boss, because I hear that's the good leadership. <laughs> um, um, so, thank you for coming. I assume that you're curious to know more about um, why I walk around with a giant sugar skull. Um, and I am eager to tell you that story. So. Um, in order to answer that question, hi, welcome, come on in. Um, so in order to talk about Maestro, well, I have to back up and talk about Marshall. Um, and of course, I could probably back up farther and talk about a million other things, but I understand we're not here all night and we don't want to hear about um, the thing that happened to me in kindergarten. <laughs> Not even to me. See how powerful language is? That thing that happened to me, right? Doesn't that make it sound like I had nothing to do with it? I mean, it was kindergarten. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Um, so I will, I will back up the story enough to tell you about Marshall, um, who played a catalyzing role in my own awareness, sort of like awakening and um, awareness of what's the most important thing in life, right? Like, Every day we make, we do, we do things. We behave in ways that indicate that show uh, that that indicate what's most important to us, right? Like we go to work. Going to work is more important than staying home and sleeping on the couch, right? Like everything is a value pyramid, and every decision we make is saying this thing is more important than that thing, and that's okay. It's not that's not a judgment about what choices you're making. That's just sort of an understanding of the framework that I'm working within. So, Marshall. Um, was a professor at college, in the, at the small college I went to, upstate New York. He wasn't ever my professor. He was like, a do he and his wife and his kids lived in the dorm um, where I was, you know, in school, far away from my family. Um, and they sort of took me in. They, they treated me like family in a place where I didn't feel like I had much family and I didn't feel at home with the other students there, they seemed so, like my impression of them, my impression of like a Vassar girl on campus is this, okay, let me get in character. This is like a Vassar girl on campus. <laughs> she's like always walking with purpose, she's like knows what she's doing. She's directed, she's strong, she's powerful, and I didn't have that. I was like, I don't even know where I'm going. I can't walk that fast. I mean, my body, you know what I mean? I didn't, I, I was like, aren't you guys, don't you wonder? if like archaeology is really what you want to know about, but maybe they didn't, and maybe they did, and I, I don't know what their journeys were. I know that I felt confused and sort of lost in college, and that I thought I was supposed to feel differently, and Marshall and his family sort of normalized me um, in a way that maybe you guys have someone in your lives that played a role that wasn't, you know, biological, but that was embedded in your heart. <laughs> um, and, then, and then Marshall and his family continued to stay, part of my family as I left college and um, chose to find a way to get back to the East Coast like every year or every other year and visit with them and reconnect. And so as their kids grew up, like we, we maintained a relationship, which was great, um, nourishing, and um, that made it all the more surprising when I heard that Marshall had been diagnosed with cancer um, because that's never what you expect to hear about anyone that you know or love, especially like healthy people who you expect, who like good people, right? Like he's a, he's a, he was such a good person that I thought, well, that's not, that can't be right. Like he didn't earn that, right? Like he didn't, 
That's not fair. And then I, then I realize um, it's not, like fair doesn't matter. In fact, in fact, Marshall um, was a biology professor and at one point um, when I was visiting over the years, I've, I was just thumbing through one of his biology books, like 101, like I was an English major, I don't know any of this stuff, <laughs> carbon bodies. Um, and I saw like, you know, basic modes of survival. It's like, these are the ways that living things survive. You can, you can hunt, I don't know if there's scientific names that I don't know and I'm sorry, but you know, you can hunt for things, you can be a predator, right? You can, um, but it's not just like what you're eating, it's like the method by which you collect food or nourishment or calories or energy. And one of the modes of surviving is parasitic. <laughs> and I told Marshall in this book, years before his diagnosis, I was like, Marshall, parasites, that's not fair. <laughs> and he was like, mm, Evelyn, mm. like, do you understand, do you know, do you understand that most living things will die by being eaten alive? Do, do, like, do you understand the ratio, the fate of most living things is to die by being eaten alive? And I thought, uh oh. And he said, this is, this, this is not about fair. <laughs> so he had already set the stage years ago to help to, to show me that carbon bodies break, which did not make it any easier to find out that his was breaking. Um, hey guys, if you're here for the talk, you're welcome to come in. If you're not here for the talk, then can you scoot along? <laughs> um, so when I heard that Marshall had been diagnosed, I um, called Maribel right away to ask for permission to come be there. Because I know in those times of crisis, if you guys have ever been around people um, in those moments of high need, <laughs> Uh, it's not always the most helpful thing to be there, right? And I didn't want to be, if, I, if my presence there like sucked energy out of her, then I didn't want to do that. Um, so I got permission and I bought a ticket and I flew out to New York. Um, and in those moments of sort of living with this little village of people who had collected in the same way, who had asked for permission to come be there, right, to like help with the things that you, that a house needs to do. There were four of us, sort of like cousins and uncles and friends and ex-colleagues and just the people who all loved this family. And within this little village, <laughs> present in the house while Marshall was in his bedroom in his hospice bed, um, I... I saw a lot of things about how humans can take care of each other um, if when things are working well. Um, but that community, that teamwork, didn't diminish the mountain of sad that we were all living on. We all knew that we were only there because this mountain of sad had grown up from under us. And if your life has ever known a mountain of sad, then you know. You know that I mean, maybe you respond to it differently. I just wanted to get off. I just wanted to, I just wanted it to not be real. Like, I don't, but, Mar but Marshall, I don't want you to be sick. I, re I don't, no, nope. <laughs> That's not okay with me. And then always his voice in the past would come to me and say, this isn't about fair. So there was a m moment, <laughs> there was a moment at Marshall's bed, um, and thank you for those of you who know this story already. Thank you for letting me share it again. It's so it was so profoundly altering in the trajectory of my life that it seems like the right thing to share now as I um, explain <laughs> how this fellow uh, became part of the story. Um, so Marshall was in his hospice bed that was next to his regular bed um, <laughs> and people you know were coming and going and you know there's a there's teen you know it's nurse and there's like people administering medication and there's always like whispers of I mean it's a like there's a lot of work to be done when someone's body functions are shutting down um, and I walked in and I saw that his eyes were I just thought he was in such pain that I 
started like scrambling for like, what, what can I do to help? What would I want if I were this vulnerable? Um, and, and I remember it when I was in childbirth, which I had babies at home, so like I had the flexibility to be able to say like, can you guys turn the lights off? Um, which they did, and I remember wanting that. I remember like, please don't, like the lights are taking energy out of me to have to like protect myself from them. And I saw that Marshall's eyes and we turned off the lights and I could see this sense of relief on his face and that made me feel good because some part of me was like giving, <laughs> even though I couldn't take away the thing that was killing him. Um, and I sat down by his bed and I asked if I could hold his hand because consent, <laughs> consent, consent. Um, I don't like it when people touch me without asking, verbally or non-verbally, right? Like if I see an old friend and we like say, we do this with our arms, like of course I want a hug. Hey guys, come on in, make yourselves comfortable, hi. Um, I'll get you a beverage after the presentation. <laughs> um, um, yeah, this, this is where I need an assistant to be like, this is what you're talking about. Um, okay, Marshall, hands. <laughs> Marshall, hands, death. <laughs> Um, so I, that was another thing the village taught me is like, you have to laugh sometimes. You have to laugh on the mountain. You have, it's, you can't, living on a mountain of sad without laughter will kill you too. So I'm in Marshall's room. Uh, he's quiet. He's in pain. He, you can, I don't know if you guys have been around someone who's that sick. Um, but every body function becomes labored, you know? Every, like, like breathe, you can see how much work it, it cost him to breathe. And you could see him wince when something, like when something that I don't know what just pained him. And his eyes were closed. He had been sort of out of it all day, just not, not um, verbal or, or interactive. Um, and I sat down and I asked to hold his hand, consent, that's where we were. And he, he sort of smiled, he either smiled or nodded. He gave me some signal that that was okay. And I held his hand, I just took his hand in my hands and I sort of petted him. You know, it was like as much love as you can muster through that contact. And it was... It was a moment of such profound connection where like all I was saying to him with my hands is, I love you. Because that's all you want to say when you know there's not much time to say anything. All, when, that, when that time is precious, you realize, okay, like if I just edit out all of the stuff that's not important, what's the thing that's left? The thing that's left is, I love you so much. <laughs> And I said, I'm sure I said it. I'm sure I said it. Marsha, I love you. Because I knew it was safe, you know what I mean? I never, like people, in, people since then have been like, did you have a crush on Marsha? I was like, oh God, guys, no. I'm sorry that I have to say that. No, it was not a romantic love. It was a deep familial love that was grown over all of the years that I had known him. Like an uncle, right? So I tell him I love him and, and I'm holding his hand. And at one point, he just opens his eyes. And I saw him. I saw him, um, I saw who he was when he wasn't a name. He wasn't Marshall. He wasn't a man. He wasn't a professor. He wasn't like all the things that we know of ourselves, which are these great, beautiful labels and ways for us to be expressive and individual and like, they were good things, right? It wasn't labels like, I reject labels. Like, he was all these good things. He was a dad. He was a professor. But all of those things that he was, all those layers of identity, were just thin. If, if I thought, I thought, like, his veils are thin. And so what was under all those veils, under, like, the thing that kept him alive, but barely, was, was so clear to me in this moment of his transparency. And he, I mean, it looked warm. Like if I could, you know, if I could like 
Instagram edit, <laughs> like the tone of the room, it was so warm. It was like he was a glow, it was like the orange moon. You know when the moon comes up over the horizon, it's just like this warm glowing orange. That's how his whole, it's all of his skin looked. And it was, it was such a sense of profound love, like that what he is is just love. It's not, it was, it was, I was like, I see your soul and it's love. But I didn't use those words, I just felt it. I was just like, it was like a hot tub. It was like being in a hot tub. You don't have to say like, I'm in a hot tub, it's hot. You just are in a hot tub and it just feels good. I mean, if you like hot tubs. <laughs> it felt good to me. It felt like being in a pool of perfect, tranquil love. But I wasn't really in a pool. I was still the separate body. And then he showed me, like through his hand, like all of my molecules sort of woke up simultaneously to show me that I was that same, like the thing that made me alive, the thing that made my body not a dead body, was that same glowing, golden, perfect love light that he showed me he was. And I hear all the words that I'm using and I hear them with my old ears and I think, crazy. That's crazy. That's not, that's not real. And that's okay. That's okay. I, I, I received that message, that truth, when I was ready for it. Or when, I, I mean, all things unfold as they need to. Even the stuff that hurts a lot. That's not, that's not an excuse for like human rights violations. I'm not saying everything's fine. <laughs> I'm saying, because I can hear, I can hear all the haters right now. I can hear the haters yeah. online. Everything's not okay. Yeah, okay, okay, you're right, you're right. I get it. Thanks guys, turn your phones off. <laughs> what is it, 2002? <laughs> um, but I also knew in that moment that no matter how crazy this experience felt when I tried to wrap it in words, right? No matter how crazy I knew it sounded to my old ears, that didn't matter because it was so deeply true that part of the message, it reminds me of Princess Leia. She's like, this message, something, something, self-destruct, right? It's like, I have this important thing to say, but part of the message is like, right, isn't like the code? And I taught, right, just, there's gotta be something in Star Wars. I don't know anything. Doesn't you, don't you have to know how to click it in and plug, like, part of what's embedded in the code is like self-destruction or like, no? It just doesn't reach Maybe like, it was the, It's kind of a like fragmented message. Fragmented, okay, well that does not serve my purpose, so scratch that metaphor. <laughs> I don't know Star Wars. It's poorly acted, poorly written, and fun to watch. And any Star Wars fan who disagrees with that is probably lying to themselves. <laughs> Take that world. I'm just gonna say my opinions that are unrelated to what I'm really talking about. So, but part of the message that, that part of the message of like of Marshall's um, transmission <laughs> was that this was the most important thing I would ever know. Was that if I thought that going home and going to work and like stressing about money and stressing about my body shape or stressing about what that person said the other day or stressing about um, what was going to happen tomorrow. Like, none of that was real. That was part of the message. And as I'm like, it just felt, you know what, it felt like electricity. It felt like he, he had plugged into me. He was moving his, I get it, I, get it, I hear it. His energetic light was flowing with the same current through my energetic field. And then I realized not only is he golden light and I'm golden light, but everything in between us is golden light. So it's like I'm a hot tub, sitting in a hot tub. Like you can't be a hot tub sit. Like a hot tub in a hot tub is just water, right? Like nothing, there isn't separation. There are, like I'm a drop of golden light in a pool of golden light. And you're a drop of golden light in a pool of golden light. That's how I see it. You can use your own words to wrap it. You can disagree. All of that is fine. What I knew to be true in that moment was that the light that animated him was the light that animated me and that separation was an illusion, and that everything I did from that moment out to anyone else, it wasn't just a metaphor of like, oh, if I treat you poorly, I'm gonna really get it in the end. It wasn't like karma, 
I don't know. I mean, I get that that's just another way to tell the same story, but it was like, if I behave with a, with hurtfulness in my intention, if my intention is hurtful, then there is no other. It's not like it would be like the, it would be like stabbing your hand and being like, well, my heart's not gonna, die. my heart's fine. Was nothing. I didn't stab my heart. You're like, well, there's part of the same body, so it affects. It's not just the ones. The you know, you can't, you can't separate. Maybe that's it. That we all feel like we're all parts of the same body. And <laughs> when I received such a profound message, I was looking at Marshall crying, like crying in the way that I've only done watching um, Franklin Time, <laughs> where you're like smiling because it's so moving and crying up this these sides of your eyes because there's nowhere else for all of that to go. See it. If you guys haven't seen it, see Franklin Time. Don't even wait to read the book because the movie's kind of better. Movie's kind of better. There I said it. Movie's better. Franklin Time. And how, yeah, they're just, it's like, you're like, oh yeah, women, yeah, feminine energy. That's dope, that's powerful too. Or whatever, you can think whatever you want. Again, tangent, thanks guys. Mm. Stay, stay with it, I'm with it. <laughs> stay together. So when I, okay, so when I got this message that, the, that this is the most important thing I'm ever gonna know, uh, it's like, um, it's hard not to have, like, I was like, wait, who, um, uh, Okay, this is the most important thing I'm ever gonna know. In fact, right when I finished, right when, I mean, I could hear Maribel sort of coming in through the ether. You know when you're, you know when the whole room disappears because whatever's happening between two people, like falling in love. I could hear Maribel's voice like starting to come in like through the thickness of whatever space Marshall and I had created together. And she was saying, I kind of just want my husband back. And I, and I was like, oh, oh, um, yeah, sorry, I, sorry, I really, like, my point was not to be in your way. And, but I felt conflicted because clearly these, this moment with a dying man, like he was in it too. And I felt like I needed to honor his needs and his, communi his nonverbal communication to me that he wanted me to stay with her needs for me to give them some space. I thought, well, I should... I should do the thing that someone just asked me to do. So I went outside and I remember, I, how many times have I talked about this? <laughs> I remember like, I remember do, thinking I was gonna throw up and just doing this with my body. And like, <gasps> it was so, I've never felt anything so big in me. Okay, stop it, don't. <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that I, have you guys ever felt that? Where like something affected you so powerfully that you had to move your body around or spit? Has it? Okay, good. I don't think that, I don't think I'm making it up. You know what I mean? Has this been untucked the whole time? Goose. How do I look? Better? Staying on task. Yeah. So I went outside, I released some energy, and I, and then I had to wonder, if I, if so, if basically I, if my boss just told me, uh, this is the most important thing you're ever gonna do, every other project is not important, just ignore anyone who tells you to do something else before this, don't do it. Always do this first, um, until you feel something this deeply move you to do something else first. Which is scary because it wasn't a boss telling me that, it wasn't someone who's like, I have a paycheck for you, <laughs> work 40 hours, like follow these rules. It was a dying man telling me. Because it wasn't really him, right? It was like the thing that he is underneath and the thing that we are underneath showing itself. That, it wasn't Marshall telling me. It was, it, was the, it, was, it was the God light in him igniting. Not even igniting. My God light was already ignited. It was me pulling my eyes open. Him pulling my eyes open. And then realizing, oh my gosh, this has been here the whole time. This miracle of being alive has been here the whole time. So, the first shape that that experience took was this sort of message that um, life, is, life is limited. You can say life is short, but that sounds 
no one hears that anymore. And it's really short, I mean, short is relative, right? Like an elephant is big next to a mouse, but an elephant's not big next to a house. So everything's relative. That's what we operate on is spectrums and wavelengths. That is just true. That's not wooey fooey, that's science, right? So I, I guess I, I didn't know how to obey, <laughs> to voluntarily obey this instruction, which was to live and breathe and behave and think and speak in a way that honors this truth always, this connectedness always. Don't, you, can't, you can't be, you can't understand that we're all golden light and then flip someone off in traffic. You know, you can be, you can disengage from people who are hurtful, right? Like you, can, you don't have to just accept, you don't have to make yourself vulnerable to everybody's input. But if I'm going to listen to this message, I have to be a consistent human every waking breath. I can't go to work and pretend like something else is more important than this. And if I find, I mean, if, if a livelihood manifests in a way where I have to sell some product, I will accept that as part of my path, right? Or I will trust that the product will be in tune with the thing that I know is true. But this big scary leap of knowing that having a job is not more important, <laughs> this is controversial, being a mom is not more important in my call, in my journey. My motherhood role was primary in my life for a long time. And this memo from this bigger boss told me, you can still, loving your children is part of being aware that you're connected to all people, but your message is bigger than the two people you happen to make. So that was <laughs> kind of scary, <laughs> kind of powerful. Um, and <laughs> eventually we'll even get to talk about this guy. <laughs> um, so fast forward from like Marshall's death, because a few days later, he stopped breathing. And then I realized, oh, that's the difference between a living body and a not living body, is when we, when that stops. And it, wa it wasn't any less sad because we knew it was coming. It wasn't. The, the, qual the quantity of like, like the mountain of sad. <laughs> it's awful. It's awful when a person's body ends. And within that awful, um, nauseating, like hot, uncomfortable thing that exists in, on that mountain of sad, I knew that there were only gems that were like endemic to that environment. There were like treasures in the spiritual landscape that were only available on, on that mountain. You follow? Like I could have never, maybe that's not true. I don't know about never. I think the, the message that Marshall gave me would have been harder to see if he hadn't been about to die, even though it's just as true. Okay, so fast forward a few months, he died in October of 2016. I um, lived in Mexico for three months with my kids, um, homeschooling and teaching them Spanish or getting other people to teach them Spanish um, from January to March in 2017. And within that time, I saw this giant sugar skull in a window like in the shop. And I thought, I don't even like skulls, but I really like that thing. I really like that thing for no reason. I don't know, what, what do you do with a giant? I don't know. I like it a lot though. And I went, I finally walked in. I asked them how much it was. They told me a thing. I was like, yeah, right. Like, just give me the real price. And then she told me the, you know, the special tourist price for you price. I was like, eh, we're still not at the real price, but thank you. We'll get there. Like, it's fun, right? Get on your game and negotiate. Um, this was in Merida, in the, a little a city, a big city in the Yucatan, where I had been living. 
Um, but I was ready. I'd learned from travels in the past. That you don't buy a big thing at the beginning of your trip. <laughs> it's inconvenient, and you can probably get it later. <coughs> so um, I ended up taking a weekend trip to Chichen Itza uh, with my kids and some friends. And, um, and there are, like, miles and miles of stalls of vendors there. Like, I don't, I'm, I mean, I had never, I had been there at night. It's a Mayan ruin. Chichen Itza is a Mayan ruin. It's one of the seven new wonders of the world. It's not a pyramid. It's a, were we talking about this? What's it called when it's not a pyramid? It's like steps up, but it like goes into, it's like a zig, 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 ziggurat. ziggurat. Yes, thank you. Yes, go village. Vocabulary. Um, it's stunning. It's like a stunning piece of human history, right? And it's pretty powerful to, I mean, they have, they have like this, um, uh, I think it's called Tok uh, Tok. Puck, yeah, Tok Tok. It's like a game. It's sort of like Mayan football. Um, uh, except it involves human sacrifices, I think, because I listened to the tour on Spanish. <laughs> and I understand 85% of Spanish. But I'm pretty sure that their big sport, that their big like stadium sport, uh, that you can walk through the stadium, involved like the sun rising, the sun setting, and, and human sacrifices. And I know that other places, like the giant cenote, which is like a sinkhole and a s s water on the bottom, uh, was definitely involved in human sacrifices. And I de so, so there's like a lot of energetic um, intensity still living in this place. Um, and in one of the stalls, uh, one of the vendor stalls, which tended to sell like themes of the same thing, right? Like, oh, I've seen that, th I know that thing. And like, you sort of get a feel for what's for sale. I, ha I, saw, I saw this fellow for sale and I thought, yeah. I like the thought of that, like maybe I can get it for me. It was really just the, I, I just really wanted to negotiate. The negotiator in me wanted to get it for cheaper. Um, and I did. The guy sold it to me for less than it was for sale in Merida. Um, and, I, and I bought, you know what I mean? He put it, like, he put him in a, he put him in a bag. Uh, and then walked with me to the ATM and I gave him like pesos and I walked away with him in a bag. Uh, and then, Brought him home and put him in my living room um, and like looked at him. Just, I like couldn't get enough. It was, so, it was like a new lover, you know, or like a new piece of art. I guess that's probably more appropriate. It was just a new piece of art that I could like touch and explore. And then all these things that I hadn't noticed before started like coming out at me. And uh, my friends gave me a really hard time uh, down in Mexico. Like we'd go have a pool party and I'd bring him. I'm like, sorry. Really? Really? To the pool? And I was like, look at him in the sun! He's beautiful in the sun! <laughs> and, um, and that was all well and good. <laughs> and when we got back from Mexico, and a few months later, like, all my relationships changed, and my then-husband and I decided, like, we're not really good for each other anymore. Like, what if we just let go? And we're like, oh, great, yes, thanks! Like, yeah, go team! We re really, we really did it right force done right but in that even in that moment of separation the first thing he put in like my pile of stuff was this guy um people just knew that like he was special to me and <laughs> and then um I went back to New York for the year anniversary of Marshall's death um it was about a year I actually went a little after a year because I know everybody shows up right at the year anniversary and then everybody leaves right when it's over. And I thought, maybe what Maribel needs is some support, you know, on the tapered ends of that. Um, so I flew back out to New York uh, to see her, and she, I mean, it was great, because it was sort of a re-embodiment of that village, and we could retell stories about Marshall and laugh and cry and do all the things that you do when you're just humans connecting. And she pulls out these um, stress balls, like the, uh, like the squeezy, what are they called? Right? Stress balls? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like a ball. Squeeze them. I don't know. Uh, but they had sort of this vinyl covering that was painted. And I remember them. As soon as she pulled it out, she was like, what I just found. And they were tiny squeeze balls that were Day of the Dead skulls that Marshall had had in his hands the whole time he was in, at, at home, dying. Um, it, I mean, when your body's in that much pain, but you don't have any strength, like every last in the inch of your energy goes out. Like he, he, he used them 
like, like his blankie, right? Like they were a comfort to him. And then I realized, oh, right, of course, of course I remember that now. Of course I remember that you, Marshall, like poured yourself into these Day of the Dead skulls and that <laughs> in some fun fictional way, because who's gonna prove it or disprove it, they all just like talk to each other. Like all the little sugar skulls all over the world are like, hey, get her down here to Mexico so she can pick me up. I'm gonna get her to teach me I'm gonna tell my cousin to show up in a shop in Merida and she's gonna love it and then she's gonna see me later. Like it all feels all planned out and perfect. And who am I hurting for believing that? Do you know what I mean? I'm not hurting anybody. It brings me joy to think that that is the way it all unfolded. And so he, so this sugar skull um, continued to just live in my life as like a primary object um, until until I started taking this path toward what I thought was a way to honor the promise I made Marshall, um, which was, oh, I thought I was gonna open a meditation center here in our little rural town, um, which I still might. And I thought that I was gonna go to New York and get certi certified in meditation, even though I was like, I think I know the most important thing, but like I'm totally down to learn all the other details. Like I, I don't, I'm not, it's not like I think I know everything, but I know I know the most important <laughs> um, but all like all of those doors started closing so I decided to listen to that right that okay shit the river shifts like maybe the meditation center isn't right but in the exploration of opening a meditation center I had taken meditation videos of just like talking to a camera I'm like hey guys take some deep breaths let's just give ourselves a minute to be quiet which is funny coming from me right <laughs> tranquila um, and Eventually, I just thought, maybe I'll put him in the screen. He's photogenic. And I did. And I happened to talk about Marshall during that like meditation video. I look at the camera, I was like, mm, guys, this isn't really meditation. Who, who am I kidding? Like, let me tell you what's really going on. And then I start talking about Marshall, and then I realize that this guy's in the frame, and I think, oh, of course, of course, all right, I get you, thank you. We're, all right, you're important. And then, and then I realized, like, I, I, I have legs, you don't. <laughs> you're a beautiful piece of art, and also a gimmick, right? Like, I realized that I can say the thing that I learned more effectively if people are looking at me first. Uh, and that's not, I, that's not, that's not, um, my intention is not to force this on people who don't want to know. My, it's always an invitation, not an imposition. But there's no, like, guy, like, how to be a guru, <laughs> or whatever. Like, I, and, you know, and all my friends are like, well, you can't call yourself a guru, otherwise you're not a guru. I'm like, okay, okay, whatever, you, fine, fine, you, you know the rules, you tell me then. And I don't want to be, like, I don't want to be an old Indian man with a beard. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to wear robes or, like, not drink booze. <laughs> I mean, I don't, that's, that's funny, because I really don't drink booze in excess, but I give myself permission to enjoy a glass of wine, because that's what, that serves me. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, the cost-benefit analysis is, comes out ahead if I have a glass of wine. But what I realized when I was like looking at us on camera is that he's so photogenic and he's so attention getting that, that, he, that he's like an amplifier, right? Like I don't even need to speak yet. I don't, I don't need to speak first. I don't need to get up on a soapbox in a town square, right? Like people come to me as long as I make myself available and ask, what's the, or like they say, cool skull, cool skull. And I say, great, thanks. He loves attention. And if that, and if just walking through the world with him, excuse me, makes people smile, then I feel like that's the right tenor. Like that's the right note that I want to strike. If people just smile or if people sort of think, what, what was that? Like that was a weird thing. I'm going to tell someone about that weird thing. Like, cool. That's cool. It can be, it can be a weird thing that makes you smile. I hope it doesn't make people a few people have said, like, oh, that's scary. It's like, well, that's the choice you're making to feel about it. And that's fine. You don't have to engage. I'll walk right past you, and you can walk right past me, and you never have to think about it again. But he seems like an apt 
like an appropriate gimmick, doesn't he? It's not just like wearing a funny hat, right? It's, it's like, it's this beacon of death. It's a reminder that, that Marshall didn't wake up thinking that he would be diagnosed with cancer when like his back was hurting and he was, he was loading up a kayak, you know, to go like on the river with his son. He wasn't like, oh, I'm probably gonna die in six weeks. But what his doth taught me and what Maestro now helps me remember is that I, like the likelihood is that I'm not gonna die in six weeks or six days or six years, but it's possible. I don't know. And the more comfortable I can get with the possibility that death will come someday, because that's just true. You know what I mean? Like pretending like it's not gonna come someday is a problem because it's pretending. It, being aware of that inevitable last step within these bodies helps me stay on track with doing the thing I promised Marshall I would do in repeating and being an echo for that message he hardwired into me. And Maestro has been, in the way that like a kid sort of imbues energy into a blankie or a imaginary friend, I've just decided that being an adult doesn't um, disqualify me from playing those same games, from like treating an inanimate thing as if it's a character. He's like my Wilson. Right? Like someone, someone said that, like, oh, he's like your Wilson. And I thought, that's exactly right. I had to, someone else had to show me that that was true. Right? Like we all identified with that volleyball as a character because, because that's what Tom Hanks' character had imbued into the inanimate thing. So it's a lonely road. There, there's, n no, that's not fair. That's not true. It's, I don't, I don't have a boss telling me what projects I need to get done and when. I have, I have a higher calling. And it's so scary because I don't know, because I see myself through others' eyes sometimes. I'm like, oh God, we are, we're crazy and we're gonna go broke <laughs> and everyone's gonna tell us I told you so. And then I think, well, that's not that scary. That's not scary enough to dishonor the thing I knew was true. It's not scary enough to go broke. It's not scary enough to be teased. In fact, it's not <laughs> at one point when some, some people started getting angry, um, at what I thought was, like, we're, I'm not, you know, in a way that I thought was inappropriate. Like, well, I'm not hurting, I'm not invading your space. Like, you're coming into my space and then getting angry at the thing I'm doing. <laughs> like, that's on you. You can disengage if you want. But I thought, they, <laughs> I thought, if this ends in death for us, if, like, let's just take it to the worst possible scenario, right? Let's just go there. Right? Like, not only are you broke and homeless and all of the other scary things that you think might happen, but like, let's say they kill you too. And, I, and then I thought, well, that's not, even that wouldn't stop me. That, that's not, that's not me losing. Right? That's not like a measure of success. My measure of success is whether or not I can ask myself every breath if I I'm living the thing I knew, I learned, I experienced as most important, which is that we all glow with the same light. And that if I treat you, if I send out love and respect and honor, then, then, then I'm like polishing my own soul and I'm helping shine my soul brightly so it can reflect on others. And if, I thought if we all just did that, if we all just looked inward for like a second and realized what we need to do, do on our own, in our own hearts instead of like what that, when my ex 
needed to do or what my boss needs to do. Or, and yeah, there are situations you can disengage in. If you're at a job where you're being emotionally abused, like, get out. <laughs> I'm not saying this is not an excuse to just tolerate being treated without the respect that you treat yourself. This is an opportunity to acknowledge that our power lies in our own choices, words, thoughts, and actions. Every time you think a thought like, oh, that guy. I used to be the angriest person in the world. Every thought I thought was, I wish it were different. In some way, it used to be like, I wish I were thinner. I wish, I wish I had more money. I wish that guy hadn't driven in that way. I wish my kitchen were a different color. And then when I learned what was more important, I realized that I can choose gratitude for all of those same things. You know, instead of like, oh, I wish I were thinner, I can think, thank you, body. Thank you, body. You are so strong. I haven't always put like the best fuel in you and I'm sorry, I'll do better. I haven't always like taken you out for a run when that's what you wanted to do. I'm sorry, I'll do better. <laughs> you know, in traffic, like, hey, th thanks for, that's a, I guess that guy's in a hurry. Maybe his daughter's in the hospital. Maybe I can operate with a generosity of spirit that assumes that he's not just doing it to be mean-spirited. Because even if he is, it doesn't benefit me to think that of him. I'm grateful that I have a car. I'm grateful that I have a car that works, where I can be, like, I can drive to L.A. <laughs> I can drive to L.A. from rural eastern Oregon and be stuck in traffic there and be full of gratitude that I have, that my life is so privileged that that is that is my that my problem is being stuck in traffic so the gratitude component of this conversation is sort of the like the magical chemical choice like the sprinkle of um, of attitude that in my experience changes the whole color of the water Right, like my my I had been I had been living in this like water of I don't know like anger and regret and and the wish the wish it were different I had been swimming in the wish it were different pool and then I after after seeing Marshall die and after seeing how precious every breath really is I just sprinkled a little gratitude I remember I was in my kitchen and I thought I live in my, I live in my dream house in the best neighborhood of the best little town I've ever met. I love this house, I love my neighbors, I love my people, I love my village, and I'm choosing to be upset about the color of the tile? Is that, is that how I wanna choose to spend this moment of my energy? And I thought, mm-mm. I choose gratitude. I love that I have a kitchen. I get, to I get to move my wrist like this and water comes out. Clean water that doesn't make you sick. And if I move my wrist a little this way and turn another knob, hot water comes out. I can be, I am overwhelmed with gratitude that I live in a place where that is available. And I choose that approach to the same kitchen that I used to walk in and think, yeah, this does like we're in the 90s. Anger, like anger at the time, that I used to choose anger at tile. Um, so I think that's like the long and the short of it, probably the long. Um, and now I'd be happy to open the floor to question and answer. If you guys are interested, or we can just mill about and you go and we can have some snacks and some drinks. Does that sound? So what are you doing next? Do you have a plan? Good, good question. <laughs> Great question. Um, I'm going to LA for April and May. Um, we are going to Coachella. Um, in part because it's great people watching and I want to be a person that gets watched. <laughs> 
Um, but they all, but I also, but I, they have really strict rules about what items they let in, you know, which is reasonable because when like hundreds of thousands of people are in one place, you have to be, you have to have like a system. Uh, so it's possible that he'll get rejected at the door. Um, in any case, that's neither here nor there. It'll all work out the way it needs to. Uh, LA, so this is another thing I've learned in the whole process is like when you don't have a boss, you just have to listen hard to what, like, have you guys seen Donnie Darko? Mm -hmm. um, have you, okay, so there, so if, for those of you who haven't seen Donnie Darko, um, there is like, I'm sorry, spoiler alert for a 10 year old movie. Um, like at one point he sort of sees these, like, how would you explain that? Rabbit hole? Like, it's like these tubes, these tubes of like watery, imagined space like coming out of people's chests and he's like, what the what? And then he sees the person get up and sort of follow like where that tube is going. So it's like this future, so it's like a visual representation of like what's about to happen, right? So I feel like as far as listening goes, like when I, I thought I was going to Manhattan, like when I went to New York in the fall to see Maribel, I was like, whoa, Manhattan's calling me hard. Manhattan, Manhattan, Manhattan. Like, okay, I hear it. I'm listening. Like I can feel my sort of Donnie Darko bubble pulling me this way. And I want to, you know, like, it's fun to listen. It's fun to give yourself the freedom to do what feels right. Um, but it ended up not working out. And that's okay too, because it was right then, and then things shifted. Um, so LA feels right. Um, and maybe we'll get there in some, maybe it won't feel right. Um, but last time we were there, it did. And I trust that what needs to happen in LA will happen. <laughs> also, we might start a foundation, so it's easier to raise money. <laughs> Do you still feel like you're reeling from this change? I mean, reeling? Yeah, adjusting mm -hmm. to it just because of like where you're at in your life and uh, you know uh -huh. the, the heaviness and the quickness of it all. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I assume everyone heard it, but the question was, do you still feel like you're reeling from this change? Um, and yes, yeah, I feel I not reeling in a sense of like fear, like I'm not scared of the fall, but I would say that. Um, I often have the image of having like, <sighs> it's funny, it's not all of like my tethers cut free because I feel so connected, like string theory connected to all things, but I also feel like I'm floating, like I'm falling through space, like our, you know, arms and legs just spread like, all right, I trust I'm gonna land safely if I land at all. So yeah, reeling, absolutely. Or like, um, like sometimes I'll go through these really, or I, I cycle, just like all living things cycle, like, all, you know, spectrums. So I'll cycle through um, doubt, right? Like what, right? Like seeing myself through my old eyes or all of the voices that I've just learned to mute. I'm like, you're not me, you're not me, you're not me. Like the, the me that's like, who do you think you are? You're just, you don't deserve, like all, I mean, Blessed be if you guys don't have that voice, those voices in your head, but I had some pretty loud, self-destructive voices in my head for a long time, and I feel like I learned how to turn those volumes down in this chapter of life, but yes, when I reel, um, it's because I'm cycling through a moment where those voices got just turned up a little for whatever reason. And I was like, whoa, yeah. guys, I thought, like, I know you're not me, and I'm not gonna listen, but ugh, it's hard, it's work, it's work to continue to trust or to ask, okay, is, are you coming to like, okay, old voices of doubt and meanness, are you coming to me so that I can reflect and be really objective about whether this is crazy or not? But every time I ask myself and then listen, like, am I crazy, is this wrong? Are we doing the wrong thing? Like, should I be doing something else? Every time I send that thread out into the golden pool that I'm swimming in, a golden fish always comes back. Actually, it's usually three. It's usually three big things that tell me you're on the right path, you're on the right path, you're on the right path. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Sometimes I met a guy, I met a guy in LA. I just sent an Insta message out to like a guy who seemed sort of plugged into like the dance world scene or the, you know, the party scene. I mean, not, yeah, but like professional 
for flight. It seemed, like a, it seemed like a good kid. And I just sent him a message. I was like, I'm in LA. My people don't want to go dancing. Would you, can you help a sister out? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, I can. And he and his friends, like, we met up in this place. They got me into this club. It was all, it was like, nothing, nothing about it felt like sleazy or weird, you know, which I get that could happen if you just invited yourself. And it felt like this village, this extended village, where like, yeah, I see you. Let's take care of each other. Like, if you're in my town, I'd do the same thing. And at one point in the night, I was like, thanks, um, like, thanks a lot for just being my tour guide and gu guide in general. And he goes, that's cool. I see you as our spiritual guide. Hmm. And I thought, whew, well, that doesn't tell you you're on the right path. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. You know, like, thank you for telling me that because it helps me know that I'm doing something right. Or people will say out loud, a woman on the street was like, cool skull, did you make that? And I might, you know, now I just say, oh, no, with my hands, but with my heart. Um, and she's like, cool, well, whatever you're doing, you're doing it right. I thought, thanks, lady. You don't, I'm never going to see you again. Maybe. I don't know. Who knows? But thank you for saying, thank you for nourishing me in that way just enough to get me through to the next moment of doubt. Reeling, yes. I've, it's, it's hard to live outside of convention. People get uncomfortable and they're like, you don't have a job? What do you do? And I was like, well, what do you, why do you care? What do you, I don't know, what do you do? <laughs> you sit in an office all day? That sounds crazy. <laughs> but you do you. I'm not, like, I'm not, yeah, your job, it sounds crazy to me. It sounds I no, I couldn't do I couldn't do it because I that is so such a dishonor of what I want what I'm called to do that I I understand that I'm I understand that we have been taught things about the way the world works that we don't even realize we've been taught. And we've been taught things like, oh you work hard and you suffer a little or a lot. And like we value suffering in this weird way, and then when you retire, then you can be happy. Then you're allowed some peace. But if you find peace before that, if you find like, if you live with that, with that, like if you just let go of that suffering, people are like, wait, what? How, you're a bad mom. <laughs> uh, you, uh, how do you make money? And you're like, well, um, I can, you can. Uh, I, that's kind of rude, right? That's kind of a rude question. I don't. I don't care about your money, unless you have a lot, and want to share, and then we'll nourish each other. <laughs> I'll leave guided meditations, and you get out your checkbook. <laughs> Not you, personally. <laughs> talking to my LA people. <laughs> um, but that does, yeah, I, I bought beer and wine. I paid a lot for this space. I'm going to talk to them. I think I paid too much, but that's cool. It's fine. It's a good cause, and if they, if it's what I need to pay them, that's fine. Um, but I do. I mean, if you guys feel called to leave a few bucks, I accept generosity with gratitude to help put a dent in the expense. But no pressure. I really give it. I give what I have to offer freely and with love in my heart. So, there, so again, the the invitation to donate is an invitation, not an imposition. That was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He really likes that. He really likes the attention. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. I, um, you know, had all the panic moments that no one was going to be here. I really appreciate you guys showing up. So, Village! Shall we drink and eat? Or, I mean, you do it. <laughs> but I got snacks.